Please turn in your Bibles to Philippians 3, verses 4 to 11. Lose all to gain Christ. Oh, please allow the kids to go ahead and go to their classes. <laughs> They'll understand that probably better than what I'm saying, so we're glad, glad for that opportunity and for those workers. Philippians 3, verses 4 to 11. And just to remind you, this is uh, taking us back to Philippi here. Paul writing from Rome in about AD 62. The church started about 12 years before in AD 50 on the second missionary trip. This is a much loved church. Let's read it. Continuing his thought about putting no confidence in the flesh, he says, Although I, miss, I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But... Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own delivered from, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The discussion, of course, in Philippians is all about standing united in joy. And this particular passage is a warning about those who would say you have to be a Jew first before you can become a Christian, much like uh, Paul's discussion in Galatians about the Judaizers. And he's saying, you know, all these different things that I used to consider value are all loss. Salvation first to last is from God, first to last. From choosing to love us, the unworthy, all the way through glorifications, all from God. Yet there were dogs, evil workers, and the false circumcision who tried to lead the saved astray. They wanted to say that we needed human works of some type, whether it was circumcision or various laws that they followed or so forth. Those had to be done before one could become a believer. And among those was Paul. How does he know so much about works-based religion? How does he know so much about... Uh, self-righteousness because if there was a, a poster boy for self-righteousness this would be the guy we don't think of him that way but when he was Saul he was a self-righteous king I mean that was he was the king of self-righteousness he would put all the confidence in the flesh in fact if there were legalists he would out legalize them he had he had credentials used to be that he trusted in his position and his works. And when he told the Judaizers that, you know, that they were wrong, he knew from firsthand experience because he was the king of those who would oppose Christ, becoming the obvious model for all time for the fact that anyone can receive grace as God directs. And blessedly, with accounting precision today, what he's going to do is he's going to talk to us about how what he used to count, so this is a very much an accounting term, this was what I thought was gain. It was turned out to be complete loss. It was rubbish. Instead, righteousness comes as we know Christ. It's crucial for our eternal lives, and he's going to talk in phases about condemnation, verses 4 to 6, We'll see justification in verse 7, sanctification in 8 to 10, and glorification in verse 11. In other words, the entire panorama of 1 through 8, really, of Romans in just a few verses here in Philippians. No salvation phase is accomplished in human strength. It must be from God. 
and especially as we see sanctification today, he's going to be warning us that we can't do it on our own. So don't think that you can. No phase of salvation is on our own. In fact, they are from God. The very ability is from God. Our human strength to kill, or what the Puritans would call mortifying the flesh, impossible. He wrote to the Galatians and he said, Are you so foolish, Galatians 3.3, 3, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? By the way, the flesh was the part, the part of, of, nature, of our human nature that's completely opposed to God. So how are you looking to the flesh, which is opposed to God, to find anything that's going to honor God? You know how the, the world's religions say, oh, just look within. You don't want to look within. It's not good in there. Okay? Unless you've already been saved, in which case you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But not in the flesh. He continues in Galatians 5.25, if we live by the Spirit, let's also walk by the Spirit. And then in verse 16, he said, if we walk by the Spirit, we won't carry out the desires of the flesh. So why are we even looking to the flesh to become more like Christ? Complete opposite place to look. The Spirit's completely opposed to the flesh, and he alone is able to defeat it. Trust him and not your strength for so-called righteous, your so-called self-righteousness, right? True believers worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. So, know Christ, lose all to gain him, so that you can attain to the resurrection. That's what this is about. Let's start with condemnation. Let's, let's summarize what uh, Paul has to say here about his days when he was Saul. What's he have to say? He says that, uh, you know, although, you know, don't put any confidence in the flesh, verse 3, but he says, you know, but if anybody could, this is what I used to think. The I is emphatic. Although I, myself, might have confidence even in the flesh. This is his old thinking. This is the condemnation stage. So as opposed to what he tells us that we must boast only in the Lord, this is what his boasting was before he was in the Lord. And he basically marches through seven different pre-salvation bases, the first three of which are boasting in his position. The last four are boasting in his effort. Again, neither one of which is going to be the issue because his position was wrong and self-effort is not going to be enough to be saved. He says, if anyone has a mind, emphatic, I myself, and I far more, again, em emphases, you can't claim more humanistic self-righteousness than Paul liked to, liked to proclaim when he was in Saul's stage. He says, first, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That was required by the law. And that was the main claim of the Judaizers. Look, you've got to be circumcised. Got to follow the law. Not to become a Christian, but to be an obedient Jew. But their claim was you had to have that to be a Christian. Paul said, got that. And I want to use some subtitles that were uh, from John MacArthur's section on this. And he says, simply summarizing, salvation is not by ritual. Salvation is not by ritual. Secondly, he says, I was of the nation of Israel. In other words, I was born a Jew. The chosen people, those who were entrusted with the oracles of God, right? That's, that's something to brag about. The chosen people. But you know, salvation is not by race either. Thirdly, he says, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. Look, look Benjamin was, that's the favored son, wasn't he? Born from Rachel, the last son, the only one born in the promised land. The tribe that went out before, they were the great fighters. They were the ones who led the charge whenever, whenever Israel went to fight. This is, and they had the first king, didn't they? Probably who Saul was named after. That's of the tribe of Benjamin. I've even got, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Salvation's not by rank either. So he starts boasting about his effort. He says, you know, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was, you know, I was born in Tarsus in Cilicia. But I wasn't going to be Hellenized. I wasn't going to become like the Greeks. I wasn't going to let the world affect me. I went to study under Gamaliel. Great school. Right place to go. For Pharisaic legalism. He grew. He moved to Jerusalem. 
got trained by, by Gamaliel, learned all the traditions, but you know what? Salvation is not by tradition either. It says, as, as the law of Pharisee, <clears throat> there are only about 6,000 Pharisees we know from Josephus in the time of, of Christ. About 6,000, very select group. Pharisees were the legalists of legalists. It wasn't enough to have 613 Old Testament laws, many of which were ignored. We add some others to replace them to make us appear even more pious. And as a result, you know, we had the legalistic, we had it down. We even added our own laws. And on top of that, of course, they added authoritarianism. So you've got the legalism plus authoritarianism. They were, they were in charge, they thought. They elevated themselves above the Mosaic law, which was from God. And this, uh, this group had sort of come out of the synagogue system, which originally under Ezra was a great thing. It brought the people back to God during the Babylonian captivity. Their name comes from uh, Fered, we believe, which is to separate. And they had separated themselves from the hoi polloi, as they would say in Greek, or as they would say in Hebrew, the am ha'aretz, the people of the land. Ah, the average people. We were elevated. We were separated. They had the greatest influence at that time on the people, and they still do today because they were the writers of the Talmud. And the Talmud is taught in synagogues today, not the Old Testament. And so they still have the greatest influence on the Jewish people. But you know what? Salvation is not by religious religion. Okay, just, just not by religion. As if that weren't sufficiently committed to be a Pharisee, he adds on top of that, oh yeah, I was also the chief prosecutor here. I was, as the zeal, a prosecutor of the church. This was his continual process. How do we know that that was his continual uh, practice? Was because that's what he says. It's in present tense continuous. He said, I was continually zealous. I was more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions, he said in Galatians 1.14, than others of his countrymen. So much so that he, of course, was going out to kill Christians which he thought was offering service to, to God, just exactly as Jesus had said in John 16, 2. He thought he was doing service to God by killing these Christians. He was sincerely wrong. He recognized the misdirected zeal, of course, of the nation, as we, we read in Acts 22 and in Romans 10, because he had been there too. He was, as I said, really the pinnacle of misdirected zeal. Amazing that God could save any of us. See, when he, when he um, you know, thought that uh, there could be nothing more done, that was in human effort. Since, but salvation is not by sincerity. And the last of his boasts is the unspiritual merit system, if you will. Sounds good. He says, uh, he says I was blameless. He said, I was, I was found blameless. By the way, what is the normal, when we go to evangelize people, what's the normal claim of those who are lost? Well, I try to be a good person. You know, I, I cut my neighbor's grass the other day when they were gone. Pay my taxes most of the time. Maybe, hopefully all the time. Uh, you know, I do all these various things. You know, this is my, my self-righteousness. I'm, I'm blameless. Nobody, nobody blames me for anything. Not sinless, which is the standard, but blameless. Okay? When he sinned, Saul would have been the first to the temple with the biggest sacrifice. He would have been the, had the biggest and the best sacrifice, and he would have been the first one there when he sinned. He was trying to be a good person. Only perfection is the only standard. And close to it isn't good enough. Salvation is not by legalistic righteousness, not by works. So, so not only did these seven claims not save him, but until he was knocked down by Christ on the road to Damascus, they not only didn't save him, these same boasts hindered him from salvation. They were not a neutral. They were not an oh, by the way. Because he was clinging to them, these were seven individual idols that were hindering him from God and from true righteousness. Idols of the heart blocking the worship of God 
aiding the worship of self. But before we consider that, oh, this is just in that time and that Phariseeism isn't uh, really an issue, hey, it's alive today in North Texas, okay? I know about that personally, seen it. But it's alive in all of, all of the world. There's all kinds of attempts to do something to believe in other than the true God and in his strength. It's only by God himself and the work he has done through Christ that we can ever have any aspect of salvation. So Phariseeism, yeah, you know. We need reformation before revival. Then we can help others who are, clung to, who are clinging to these same ritual, race, rank, tradition, religion, sincerity, and works by exposing the inadequacy of their self-righteousness. In other words, look, it ain't going to happen on your own. If any human work could save, then God the Father would be cruel to have sent his son to, to die for us, wouldn't it? If there was another way to be saved, then somehow that would be to accuse God of being unrighteous by sending his son to die for us, wouldn't it? To make that sacrifice. May it never be. And we can't get enamored in our own pedigrees either. We, if we read this guy, go to this guy's seminar, go to this guy's seminary, and that guy let us help us come to Christ, helped us to grow, helped us to advance the kingdom, so be it. God bless him. Great. But in and of themselves, if they were a replacement for, for true godliness, then they are also rubbish. The issue is, do we know Christ? Have we trusted him as our Lord and Savior? If those things point us to that, excellent. If they get in the way, they are idols to be, to be removed, to be put in the loss category. And so he does. He says, that was how I was before. And just like he makes a great contrast in Ephesians 2, verse 4, and he says, but God being rich in mercy, right? But, and he says, justification, verse 7. This is the glorious transition from being lost to found. Lose all to gain Christ in justification. And every one of these aspects, what we are doing is we are losing ourselves to gain Christ. Lose all to gain Christ. This is the decree by which God declares a sinner to be righteous. To be, he graciously imputes the righteousness of Christ to us. He gives us positional sanctification. It begins the sanctification process. What's sanctification? Growing in Christ's likeness, being separated unto God, to be declared holy. When granted grace, the believer's former self glory is loss. His glory in Christ is only beginning. This is only the beginning. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So once faith starts, you can start pleasing God. So at that point, you can start pleasing God. Only until then. At this point, the, the new believer has denied himself to follow Christ, which is gain eternally. He's become a new creation in him. By the drawing of God, the sacrificial redemptive work of, God, of Christ and the power of the Spirit, Paul had a new method of accounting. All the things that were formerly gained to him have now been thrown over into the lost column. And he realizes that the only thing that's gained is Christ. That's it. Anything that advances the kingdom of God, anything that is it pointing people to Christ, like the Spirit's work, that's gain. Everything else is loss. Everything. Any of those seven boasts altogether and any others that we were considering possibly as, as gain. They had formerly been in the prophet column, now they're in the lost column. They, he said they were gain to me. Hmm. This is a complete and final. He says, uh, final action, he says, I have counted. Now why is that significant? But, thing, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted. Because that's the perfect tense. I say, oh, oh whoa, whoa, but so? It's a completed action with, with ramifications for the future. It's done. I have counted them. I'm not counting, I'm not going back to count them again. I have counted them. It's done. And it has continuing ramifications for the future. 
The ultimate perfect act was the cross. Done. With continuing, I'll say, ramifications for the future, correct? To tell us die. It is finished. Perfect tense. Done. That's exactly what's happening here. I have a new accounting system. All these things, Christ. That's the game. Complete and final. He's, he's evaluated with Christ's perspective for the first time. He's dropped man-centered pseudo-goodness. And he says it's loss for the sake of Christ. He was very much like the man who sold uh, his field the, 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 to, to buy a field with, he sold everything to buy a, a field with a pearl in it. Remember that? That parable? Matthew 13, verse 44 and 46. The field, because it was of great value. Everything else he sold to get that, to get that pearl. This is the ultimate pearl, eternal life. Paul was totally committed. He died to self to live for Christ. In fact, earlier in our, in our great text here, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He's mentioned it back in 121. Our Lord illustrated false righteousness as a, as a broad and popular road. People like that broad road. They like that wide gate. They like to reject the narrow way. Matthew 7, 14, For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. You know, it, this is a tough message. Our Lord's intensely interested in pleasing God and not men for being seeker-sensitive. In fact, uh, many are big event seekers. And whenever that was the case, he would just give them a tough message. For example, you know, feeding of the 5,000. And they follow him the next day, and they're going around the Lake of Gal Sea of Galilee and so forth, and they're, they're trying to find him. Gives them a tough message. Why? Because they just wanted the welfare system. That's all they wanted. They didn't want him. They didn't want to believe in him. So he gave them a tough message. So if any, and and uh, so this is typical of, of a statement to large crowds, Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life. Wow, that's a pretty tough message. That's kind of like the loss column. He cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he comes to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost? Do you hear the cost metaphor again? To see if he has enough to complete it. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. That didn't mean every single person had to sell everything he had. He had to be willing to. He had to have it committed to Christ. He had to have everything submitted to him. You know, it wasn't a popular sermon in the first century either. People left as a result of it. Because that's not what they wanted. They wanted the stuff in the lost column. You know, most likely we value our justification more if we were like Paul and had to give up much for that. Um, some examples, perhaps, um, you know, maybe we've lost friends. Maybe we've lost family, business associates, maybe a career. Paul lost all of his esteem and position in Judaism, all of it. Um, many Jewish parents hold funerals for their children when they become Christians. Uh, many converts from Islam are, Islam are executed by the state, uh, either officially or unofficially. During the 16th century Reformation, the Anabaptists would, would wait to baptize their children until they were sure that, like, really, really, with lots of fruit, evidence that they were truly believed. Their conversion, on average, uh, they would be dead, the kids would be dead within two years because that was the opposition. On a smaller note, uh, Russian Christian children couldn't take certain classes or sports or get higher than a C. They were never allowed to get higher than a C. Uh, adults were barred from any college or any leadership. You know, there's often a cost for justification, publicly proclaiming Christ, isn't there? Part of my sub-theme in, in this sermon and one of the reasons I picked this passage is because that's what we're going to be seeing in Western Christianity, and we're starting to see already. 
Has it been true around the rest of the world that Christians have been persecuted? We're going to see a lot more of that here. And already are. And it just begins with words. In Canada, they're arresting pastors for, for just preaching the gospel. And if you stand up and say that homosexuality is sin, which it is, okay, just as, much, just as adultery is and so forth, but, you know, homosexuality is a sin also. And you say things like that in the pulpit because God has said it. Guess what? You're not being inclusive. Okay? doesn't make any difference if you're right. It's just whether or not it's popular. Okay? Yeah, they're getting arrested in Canada already. Well, it's happening in Western Europe also. Martin Lloyd-Jones said if, it's, if it, true belief, is not controlling the whole of your life, then you're just not a Christian. Pretty simple statement, isn't it? If true belief is not controlling the whole of your life, then you are just, you are just not a Christian. Let's step into the sanctification stage, verses 8 to 10. Being a living sacrifice for Christ means we must also lose all to gain Christ in sanctification as well. So as you look at the verses there, you can see he's continuing to count the, uh, to use his account, uh, accounting terminology here. You know, Paul was committed. He says, more than that, even beyond what I've already said, I count all things to be lost. He's continually counting. So in justification, he said, yeah, I've already started, the, you know, that's, that's already, that's already a, the, finished, done. He says, now, as, as I continue to see new things, I continue to count them lost. Continuous, present tense. This is sanctification. You know, Paul liked sports. I like sports. We can tell because he has metaphors to boxing, running, fighting, winning the prize. And he gave all that up for his work, his ministry. He would have forsaken entertainment, light reading, most idle time. But to be a slave to Christ means not only losing the neutral stuff, it means anything that's even good if it's less than what you're called to do, the best for you to be doing, to be serving him. So... Not only the easy, nice to haves, but even sacrificing the good for the best as necessary. As a faithful slave of the Lord, Paul submitted his will to Christ, directed by the Spirit, not personal gain. The best was in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. This is an experiential knowing, the word he uses. So we think of sometimes intellectual knowing, we, reading and understanding intellectually. But then there's also experiential knowing, which is to grow in Christ. And so for Paul, that was clearly something to also know. To know him intellectually, of course, to know the word of God, as well as also to grow in Christ. Jesus had prayed, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17, 3. That's going to be an important verse as we continue to, to follow along. So to have eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. How does one come to know the Lord of Lords? Well, first of all, we have an oida knowledge. We study. We know the Word of God. We continually grow in, as uh, we learn from, from understanding. Intellectual, oida in Greek, it's a doxis, a doc, uh, the, um, the actual um, information. Secondly, we increase in knowing uh, Christ Jesus, my Lord, as we serve him. So as we serve him, we come to trust him, we depend on him, we see his strength as he empowers the work, and he directs it by, his, by wisdom as we, as we pray for, for his help. As we abide on the vine, we see fruit, we see the trials, the trusts, the deliverances, the sufferings, the surrender, the sacrifice. All along the way, the Son is drawing us nearer to him. So we learn both experientially and intellectually. All right, so as we mature in Christ, we come to realize increasingly that everything else is secondary. It's no wonder that our outlook is so completely different from the world's. 
you know, spiritual things are spiritually appraised, aren't they? 1 Corinthians 2. We have a completely different outlook, so it shouldn't surprise us that they can't really understand what we're talking about. The slave says, the master for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. So not just those things that are actively contrary, as I said, but all other things as well. All things, no compromise, no holding back. They're all suffered. They're all submitted to Christ because of his love for us. Christ didn't hold back for him, for us. We shouldn't hold back for him. Paul had suffered the loss of all things more than a quarter century before, and he hadn't changed his mind. So I'm continually counting it. And what was his new evaluation of the things that were lost? He said they were rubbish. Scubalon. Scubalon is dung, manure, waste, garbage, uncleanness. Pretty clear picture. They weren't like pretty bad. No, they were really bad. Things fit only for wild dogs, as Paul called the enemies of the cross. Just a little earlier in this chapter. In a powerful prayer of confession for Israel, Isaiah picked up this same idea. Echoes this description of unholiness. Isaiah said, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Isaiah 64, 6. I thought it was interesting that uh, um, we can get some support for this from an unlikely place, which in this case was the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, former Justice Antonin Scalia uh, exhorted in World Magazine, August 13, 2005, said, have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity. That's 1 Corinthians 1.23. And then he says, be fools for Christ, 1 Corinthians 4.10. Then he said, and have the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world, which is exactly what he was doing by saying that in World Magazine. That's, how we, that's a classic example for us. In verse 9, Paul's zeal for knowing God, for knowing Christ, with a full participation is clear in this phrase, and may be found in him. He looked forward to the final accounting the day in which all of this sanctification would be complete. He wanted his current practice to be consistent with his position, which is what integrity is all about. No hypocrisy, total integrity. Position and practice matching. Job once asked the critical question, but how can a man be in the right before God? In other words, how can any one of us stand before God? And of course, Paul answered it. He took this, this ultimate question and, and talked about the righteous standing that's only possible by Christ. Again, Martin Lloyd-Jones said that righteousness is the outstanding theme of the New Testament, uh, particularly of the epistles and most especially of Paul. Paul had a righteousness, the sanctification process. The two kinds, that uh, which is derived from the law and that which is from God are two very different things. The false one is a great evil. You know, when Paul truly understood Mosaic command, especially for, co for covenanting, he, it, it attacked him. It taught him that he was a violator of the law. The law reflected God's character, and men have understood God's nature by it. But having said that, it wasn't able to save. This is, a, this is from a quote from George Whitfield, one of my great heroes, the, the great, uh, pinnacle, the pinnacle Puritan evangelist, describing hardness of heart. This is what it's like before salvation. He said in his sermon, The Method of Grace on Jeremiah 6.14, he said that before he was saved, I was obligated to sin in order to stifle conviction. That's convicting, isn't it? In other words, he knew, he knew the truth. He was being convicted by it. And he had to keep sinning in order to stifle conviction. Dramatic, dramatically stated. You know, many, many Jews had come to prefer the symbols and types over the reality of the Messiah. And it substituted all those things that Paul now counted loss. But the second kind of righteousness is the only true one. It's from God. And it's because we're in Christ. We have a union with him. So that I may gain Christ emphatically. 
Only then do we have righteousness imputed to us and we have the standing before God. Paul forsook any righteousness of his own. Yet uh, nearly everyone we evangelize talks about having their own kind of righteousness. It, but it's always a form, a form of works righteousness. And it's not really understanding because they're at that point unca- incapable of understanding. It's only by the prompting of the Spirit that they can understand. Verse 10, Paul desired to be found in Christ, to magnify him, to know the, the, the Lord Jesus. And of course, to know him is to love him. And he was, wasn't satisfied with the initial knowing. He wanted to keep on growing. His accounting system was that he wanted to keep on setting him in the, in the, in the gain column. Not just intellectually, but more intimately and personally as well. People are known as they reveal themselves to others. And Jesus, of course, is eager for us to know him. That's why the entire Bible points to Christ up to the time of the crucifixion and then everything else is commentary on him and those gospels and of course um, his return. John 14, 21, Jesus said, he who has my commandments and keeps them loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. We will know the living word's person and will from his written word. But he also sought to know him experientially. So Paul talks about the experiential knowing him as well. And he says that um, he wanted to know the power of his resurrection. This is the divine power to save us and save others. And he wanted to know that. Since um, honor comes before before honor comes humility, it's clear that honor is going to come to those who live by faith. A faithful slave will be willing to be used by the master. A.W. Tozer said that it's doubtful God can use any man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Very often the honor of service comes at great cost, doesn't it? Very often the people have an opportunity to serve others because they have first been crushed. With a painful pruning comes greater usefulness, doesn't it? And we are able to comfort others, says 2 Corinthians 1, with the comfort in which we have been given. Calvin described this fellowship of his sufferings in two aspects. He said we need to die to self and live for Christ. Sounds like Paul writing in Philippians. Let's listen to a few verses on suffering. Romans 8, 17. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Suffering leads to glory. Colossians 1.24 Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Is there anything lacking in Christ's afflictions? Just more of them. 1 Peter 4.13, Peter agrees. He says, you know, I rejoice. He says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. So that, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. And I think the shortest summation of, the, of all this is in 2 Timothy 3.12. As he's describing his, in his last letter to Timothy personally, and he's describing, summing up what he needs to be doing. He says, you know, preach the word. He's about to get to that. But he's right here at the end of chapter 3, second to last chapter of his last writing. He says, you know, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Didn't say some who desire to live a godly life. He said, all who desire will be persecuted. When Paul was forced to defend his apostolic credentials, he did so by recounting how he suffered. Not his, not his blessings, not the visions he had, not the, not the times he spoke with the Lord, not the time he was ushered into heaven, not the time, all the different things that God had done through him. He recounted his sufferings. And of course, Martureo, 
is the basis for the English word martyr. It's not that for, any, for, uh, for without reason. That was the price paid for the opportunity to witness. Martyretto was to witness. And those who did received a martyrdom's reward. Child of God, says F.B. Meyer, is often called to suffer because there's nothing that will convince onlookers of the reality and power of true religion as suffering will do when it is born with Christian fortitude. They say that the, the value of a Christian soldier isn't on the parade field. It's in battle. He who is willing to suffer and is dead to the world is being conformed to his death. Paul said, I die daily by the Holy Spirit's work in him. You know, noble causes require sacrifice, and exalting Christ is the noblest. You know, among the, the many, many modern evils the church has been silent about, and we are being very silent and have been for centuries. We're not united in our criticism of those who whittle away at the truths of the Bible. For about two centuries, we have been silent or not united on evolution, on abortion, on psychological counseling, on homosexuality, on transgenderism, on women pastors, on critical race theory. Will churches ever have the conviction of the master if we're going to be slaves of Christ? Will we have the, the conviction of the master about these issues? Has he put them in his word so that we can know the principles and to proclaim them and stand? Are we going to stand firm? Will we be faithful slaves of the master, or will we shy away in dishonor to him and what he has proclaimed? Voice of the, Ma uh, the Martyrs director Tom White wrote, we learn that ultimately our safety is not where we are. Safety is staying in God's will no matter the consequences. Near the beginning of his first incarnation, Jesus preached the great Sermon on the Mount. And the last three verses of the Beatitudes say this. Three verses about blessings to the persecuted. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, sanctification perseveres as we finally lose all to gain Christ in glorification. And that's the last verse there, verse 11. The lifelong sanctification was commitment by Paul was in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. What a statement. He's not saying I'm, so I can earn the resurrection from the dead. You can't earn that. That's all by grace, but that I would receive it. So Paul's ambition was not only to go through the sanctification stage, as we'll see, but to finish up in glory, to attain to the resurrection. He doesn't doubt his position. He, know, he has assurance of salvation. He knows that all of that is true. He believes all the promises. He's very familiar with the hindrances, but he says, you know what? When all is said and done, I'm going to attain to the resurrection. So to summarize Paul's incredible teaching here today on losing all to gain Christ, to lose all is humility. It's the ultimate attitude of salvation. To gain Christ is salvation in all its phases, all the way from God choosing to love us, all the way through him keeping us in glory. This is an experiential sanctification cycle beyond human strength. Puritan John Owen, one of my favorites, wrote in his classic, The Mortification of Sin, he said, the Holy Spirit is our only sufficiency for the work of mortification. What's mortification? Killing sin. So on the one hand, sanctification is growing in Christ, right? And it's also killing sin. So the opposition to Christ decreases, and you need to kill it. You don't just wound sin, you kill it. And that's done by the Holy Spirit. Trusting him, we can resist the flesh, 
Man's efforts are just vanity. They're like penance, making vows, self-achievement, all those kinds of things. Those, those are just human efforts. Only the Holy Spirit is the cause of sanctification. This is dying to self and living for Christ. It's done in Christ's strength. All right, you guys all ready? Here's my summary. All right? Justification. It's done one time, right? At justification, we also receive positional sanctification. What happens then? Then we know Christ. Why? Because knowing Christ is eternal life, isn't it? John 17, 3. So when we start knowing Christ, that only happens once we're saved. Knowing Christ, if you know him, you do what? You love him. And by the way, if you love him, what are you going to do? You're going to keep his commandments, aren't you? And if you keep his commandments, what's going to happen? Oh, yeah, you're going to be persecuted. Do you see that? We need to stop thinking of persecution as, a, as ultimately, as, yeah, it's a negative, it's hard, I get, I get it, but it's not an ultimate hard. It's part of the cycle. It's expected. It's because if you stand firm, you're going to be persecuted. The world doesn't like it. Then what happens? Well, as a last step, Jesus is going to disclose himself to us because experientially, we're going to grow closer to him. When you're being persecuted, don't you turn to the Bible passionately? Don't you come home from work and say, what did God say about this? Because you're thinking about it all day long, about how you're being persecuted. Do you see, it? see that? You draw closer to him. He discloses himself, and that's knowing him. You're back to where you started. Then you love him, you obey him, you get persecuted, he discloses himself again. This is the sanctification cycle. How long do we do this? Every single time around, we get more like him. We do it our entire lives. This is walking in the valley of the shadow of death. What's that called? Life. So if we're believers, this is the sanctification cycle. When do we get out of it? Glorification. When God chooses, says, yeah, you've done enough. You've done the work I've asked you to do. You've brought me glory, the very next verse, by completing the work I gave you to do. When it's ready, that's only one time too. So one time entering the cycle many times through the cycle, unless maybe you're the thief on the cross, you only got a little bit. But for most of us, many times through the cycle, then one time, glorification. All that in this, in this small section. Glorious. Sanctification is the only phase of salvation with any human effort to it, in which you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not work for it, but work it out. Our attitude has to be humility throughout it, Yet the dynamo empowering this entire cycle, yeah, that's the Holy Spirit. That's what, that's what he does. Until we attain to the resurrection. Exactly what Paul said he wanted. That's glorification. <clears throat> but what if right now you're listening to this and you say, I, you know, I know nothing about this combat. I know nothing about this, this battle, these persecutions. I don't, even, I don't know anything about knowing Christ because I don't have eternal life. What if you're in that stage? Eternal life begins this, with this entirely different accounting system. You count everything as loss that's opposition to Christ, and you count everything as gain that follows him. We need to repent over sin, all that was in the lost column, and we need to gain Christ. That's the only way. Lose all to gain Christ. Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is eternal life. And we need to repent and believe him today. Let's close in prayer. Father, this is a, a lengthy discussion, I know. But it's a, a glorious topic. And Father, we thank you that this is recorded for us in such concise words by, by Paul. Describing this entire process of growth in Christ. How we enter into it. How we proceed through it. And to understand that, yes, this is more opportunity for us in our day to be faithful in the entire process to honor you. Whether that's when we are first believers or whether that's on a deathbed, perhaps on a entire process because we are trusting in Christ. We are being empowered in the work by the Spirit. And we know we are attaining, attaining to that joyful time of being able to be with you in person. 
Father, this is just uh, the greatest joy we can have is knowing Christ, and we will grow in that experience through all of eternity. It's in his name that we pray.